Hello. It's great to see everyone here. Already we've had a lot of interesting sessions and conversations. I'm going to start off with a couple of rhetorical questions. What common purpose do we share? I mean, what assembles this group here today? Now, I can tell you, we share a common purpose in the goal of forging a better understanding of the Earth system. We're looking for solutions. We're working on one of the most complex scientific and technical endeavors of our time. There's nothing easy about doing Earth science. It takes a big, multidisciplinary, multi-technology tent to describe and understand the Earth system. I could easily spend my whole talk just listing complexity issues, but you know these already. You face them every day. So why did we all come together here at ESIP? I've got a few new ideas to share about that. Over the last couple of years, I've been reading through a library of articles and books on creativity, innovation, and knowledge management. Sifting through all this research, there are three common themes that seem of particular value in the context of ESIP. In fact, these form a large part of the return on investment that ESIP provides to its funders and members. All of these themes are aspects of ESIP that add creative value to the work you do in your offices and labs. Let's start with the network effect. We're here to network, and the value of being a member of a network is generally quantified using Metcalfe's Law, which tells us that the network value increases as the square of the number of its members. And so, by linking through ESIP, you expand your reach exponentially. Now, that's also true of any open ne network, but ESIP goes further. Reed's Law looks at networks that have the capability of creating subgroups what ESIP calls clusters. The ability to easily spin up as many subgroups as are desired creates a new network effect with a theoretical value that approaches 2 to the n, a value that accumulates much faster than Metcalfe's original network effect. What does this mean? For one thing, this explains how clusters defeat the curse of the power law curve. Now the power law curve is how actual work in open networks usually gets distributed. It's the curve which says that 10% of members do 90% of the work. In an open network, most open source projects fail because they need to attract hundreds of members to secure a handful of active contributors, but they cannot engage the long tail. So ESIP comes along and asks these long tail folks, well, what's your biggest problem? Why not start your own clusters and get to work? ESIP breaks the long tail into any number of small, engaged subgroups. It's brilliant. ESIP now has more than 10 years of small team collaboration. Next comes requisite variety. Requisite variety comes from Aspie's law, and here's Aspie. This is what a nerd looked like in 1955. Now, Aspie's law comes from cybernetics. It's a fundamental law for designing control systems. Ashby's law says that the control system has to be at least as complex as the phenomenon it wants to control. And this law migrated into theories of knowledge management, where it describes the threshold ability of an individual or a team to predictably innovate a successful solution to a complex problem, such as, let's say, understanding the Earth system. In the face of complexity, the lack of requisite variety smothers the spark of innovation that moment of serendipity that can help you solve your toughest problem. Successful innovation starts with a creative moment that is only predictable once there is a requisite variety of knowledge in the conversation. Now in business schools they teach you how to increase the requisite variety for your team. All of these options are expensive in either time or money or both. And all of these options Assume that you need to own the requisite variety of knowledge. Now, this was the logic behind Bell Labs and Xerox PARC. But today, with the new capabilities of virtual organizations, such as ESIP, your agency or university now has another option. Now you can assemble and share requisite variety just long enough and just often enough to capture the knowledge your team needs to be innovative. For the cost of a couple employees a year, your whole agency can now borrow the knowledge it needs. 
instead of funding an entire research center for millions of extra dollars per year, building a virtual organization such as ESIP can provide a wellspring of requisite knowledge and feed the capability for innovation in your teams. Now the third theme I, I wish to discuss is the adjacent possible. This term escaped from innovation theories and evolutionary biology and into discussions of the history of human innovations. Several authors note that innovation often happens at the adjacent boundaries of knowledge domains, at the place where a problem from one arena is exposed to information from another. It's the, I never would have thought of it that way if I hadn't had that conversation moment. Almost all histories of human creativity and innovation note the importance of place. They talk of the rise of cities and of the growth of creative districts and of coffee houses. The beginnings of the scientific revolution have been tracked to the opening of coffee houses in England and Europe. Science started happening as soon as people substituted coffee for beer in the morning. But more than that, coffee houses were not clubs and so they enabled conversations between strangers. These were locations where properly caffeinated creative people, people with innovator DNA, people like the folks in this room, became intellectually promiscuous. And like a great coffee house, ESIP meetings is enable the adjacent possible. ESIP puts experts from across the entire Earth data value chain into the same room. And then it's, it adds caffeine and stands back. Coffee houses, and now virtual organizations, are what Matt Ridley calls places where ideas go to have sex. However, it's too simple to say this about ESIP. Let's be honest here. Before, I mentioned that Earth science is not easy. Well, Earth scientists are not easy either. If your idea wants to get lucky in this room, it better be really attractive. I can tell you, though, that of all the rooms on the planet today, your earth science data idea is incredibly fortunate to be spoken in this room. Most of these ideas will find someone here who knows more or knows different and will help you understand just why your ideas may not be as cute as you think it is. But that's a good thing because that conversation helps your idea become more beautiful. There are lots of rooms on the planet where earth science ideas get spoken. But I think we can agree that ESIP is a place where ideas go to get said. Let's suppose that you talk with someone about an idea. This could be a problem area, a pain point in your development effort, or any issue. They agree this needs some work. You talk with a couple more people and they also agree. So you get together to find a solution. As soon as you announce your new cluster, ESIP puts a broad range of virtual communication and collaboration tools at your disposal. And bingo, your idea just got said. The result is something new with lots of potential for growth. Recapping here, ESIP is a virtual organization that breaks the curse of the power law curve with clusters. ESIP members bring a vast amount of knowledge to the plate, and ESIP meetings and online resources enable the adjacent possible, where ideas can spawn successful innovation. There are things you can do to take full advantage of this meeting and, and also help this meeting find its creative potential. One last point. ESIP has a goal of hosting the best Earth science data meetings on the planet. ESIP looks to its members to work together to meet this goal. If you have any issues with the meeting or any experiences from another meeting you feel ESIP can learn from, we'll let the staff know. And in closing, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. And my idea wants you to know that it, it had a really, really good time. Thank you.